I'm Swapnil Bharti and we are here in Vancouver, Canada for Open Stack Summit and we have today with us Mark Shadowworth. I mean, I met you in 2005 in India. We were walking around Habitat Center and you're talking about space, your you know, travel to space. And I mean, we have known each other for so long and we are bump into each other like we last MWC, time MWC multiple other exactly, conferences yeah. That's and right. last time we met at OpenStack Sydney uh, Open Summit in Sydney yes. uh, so tell us you know how much has changed in these you know six or seven months um, and uh, so the I think the most important headlines would be OpenStack's getting real mm -hmm. so all of the hot air has come out but people still have the hard business problem right which is how do I automate my infrastructure how do I offer up infrastructure as a service from my own data centers um, I'd say AI has come screaming um, forward. We see you know, institutions across a very wide range of sectors effectively racing to stand up machine learning capabilities, hire machine learning people mm -hmm. uh, and, and support them effectively. Um, and then IoT um, has, has started to sort of really get focused on issues of security, issues of um, um, authenticity, um, uh, integration between the right. edge and the cloud. Yeah, I was at Open IoT Summit, and, uh, mm. and uh, security was almost every no matter who you talk to, yeah. for Zypher OS to everybody, they were talking about yeah. security. So, so let's just connect some dots first of all. From Canonic, I mean, I do know that you have core, you know, went to core for, uh, but from OpenStack's perspective, when you are here the, and, and you meet partners and. For IoT, what kind of trend do you see? Oh, I, I think the IoT conversation is is too far away from the OpenStack mm -hmm. conversation for me to be worrying about it here. I would say, you know, telcos are a place where this comes together. So right. in a telco meeting, we will often be talking to a group that's thinking about cloud infrastructure, mm -hmm. edge cloud infrastructure, and IoT. So in the telco context, I'd say IoT and OpenStack kind of meet under the same roof. Right. Yeah. Um, a few weeks or months ago, OpenStack Foundation came out with a white paper around edge computing, which yeah. is almost all about IoT kind of. So when you look, when you talk uh, about IoT from OpenStack's perspective, uh, what unique challenges are there? Because uh, a lot of decisions are made, made at uh, No, I don't, I don't think, uh, I wouldn't connect those conversations, okay. right? Okay. I wouldn't connect those conversations. Um, so what's interesting about um, edge computing mm -hmm. is that Within a large organization, of course, different groups have a different boundary, and that's their edge, mm -hmm. right? So within a large telco, you'll have big data centers. The edge of that mm -hmm. is the, the beginning of the next transport segment, okay. effectively. You'll have a smaller data center, which has an edge, and okay. all the way out to some router or gateway at the customer premises. Right. Um, and each of those teams effectively wants to talk about edge computing. Mm -hmm. um, for us, you know, it's very exciting for us. Every single um, reference architecture for edge cloud that's been published by a telco mm -hmm. has Ubuntu mm -hmm. and has Maz. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is pretty simple. First, the one problem that everybody has to solve in edge cloud is physical provisioning. Right. Because the one thing you can be sure of is that there's no human there, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, where's there? There right. is everywhere. And so you, 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 you have to have that bare metal automation that Maz is so good at. It's the smallest piece of software that can automate you know, from a machine which is switched off to a machine which is running Windows, CentOS, or Ubuntu. Right? So right. Maz is in every reference architecture published so far, mm -hmm. and Ubuntu is in every reference architecture published so far because of the economics. Right? Right. People, people want the latest um, uh, Linux for their developers because they want to put cutting edge applications there, um, maybe AI applications mm -hmm. at the edge. But they also know that they're going to have you know, hundreds of thousands of servers at the edge, and so they want the economics to be really good. They won't use VMware, they won't use other Linuxes. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're talking about mass, uh, when we look at OpenStack, you know, there used to be three components, storage, uh, compute, and networking. You know? So mass mostly talks about uh, compute, right? That's right. Well, it'll also know about all the disks mm -hmm. in the machines. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of a simple version right. of storage, right? Right, it'll, right? It'll just tell you, you know, how many disks are in this machine, how many disks are in that machine, and mm -hmm. it'll let you configure those disks for Windows or configure them for Linux, right? right? Um, uh, and then with regard to networking, again, Maz is only thinking at the level of the rack. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't do all of the complex right. stuff that OpenStack does with tenancy and software-defined networking, all of those things. It's really just talking about the switch, the switch ports, and the servers, and the disks. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
uh, but but uh, two other components storage and networking is also critical and canonical works with you know all those telcos as well sure so how uh, are you also planning to bring some storage solutions or you're planning to engage with the NFB communities also from canonical's perspective or not yet? I think there are there are there are two obvious storage stories that go everywhere one is directly attached storage mm -hmm. which is basically just the disks in the machine right. that's hosting the app or the or the VM and the other is Ceph, Ceph yes. as, a, as a distributed store. Now we do see appetite. There are people who are buying um, proprietary software-defined storage solutions to integrate into OpenStack, Kubernetes, and other things. Um, at this stage, I wouldn't say that there's, there's any of those that strikes me as being a breakout success. Mm -hmm. um, but um, clearly, there are some gaps in the market because we do see companies, you know, selling to our customers as part of canonical OpenStack or sort of edge cloud distributions. Right. I'll just talk about OpenStack one more time before we move to it. Uh, last time when we met uh, at Open Sydney, the focus from the foundation was more on collaboration and composability. What has, uh, what has been the theme this year? Um, well, the foundation has generalized its mission from mm. OpenStack to open infrastructure, and mm. they've I I introduced a couple of other projects alongside OpenStack. Um, Carter containers. It's really a, a sort of a next generation KVM mm -hmm. from from Intel, where I think there's a there's some really good research and development. I mean, the, 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 there's some really good thinking about virtualization, right? Which I think is actually useful for OpenStack generally. Mm -hmm. But they've positioned it as a as a container um, right. security mechanism, um, and then Zool, which I haven't really looked at, so I okay. so I can't speak to. Um, you know, this summit for me has been very interesting. You know that I caused some controversy by putting the spotlight on the <laughs> economics of ownership, mm -hmm. right? But I think it's, it's, it's very clear to me that everybody who's here at the OpenStack Summit um, is here because they feel they're responsible for a data center and they want that data center to have OpenStack in it and they want that OpenStack to work and they want it to cost a reasonable amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, we can't ignore economics. The public cloud is right. great, and yes. the public cloud makes data centers a simple economic proposition. So that's why I took such a strong focus on the money, right? For people to want OpenStack, they have to believe that it's going to come in at a price that makes sense in a cloud world. And so I was simply showing that Canonical delivers OpenStack. We deliver it um, within two weeks, guaranteed. We deliver it with hardware partners, so we really simplify the acquisition of the hardware, the, the, the reference specification, all of those things. We will operate it, and when we're operating it, you have the exact line of sight on pricing. Right? You know exactly what OpenStack is going to cost you. It's half of what you might pay for kind of traditional proprietary enterprise um, solutions, and that means it's competitive with the public cloud. I'm not trying to say people shouldn't use the public cloud. Actually, they should use the public cloud, right? You want to own a house and you want to rent some space occasionally, right? Um, or sometimes, if you need a conference center, you want to rent the conference center, right? right? Public clouds are great. Private data centers are great if they're economical and automated. Uh, and uh, when you said open infrastructure, where does Canonical fit into that new uh, theme of open stack? The, the vision for Ubuntu mm -hmm. is that it delivers the best open source software and it mm -hmm. delivers it in a format which is enterprise grade, upgrade friendly, developer friendly, right, with a, with a clean and cost effective support structure, operations set of services around it, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever open source emerges from the open infrastructure world or from the container world or from everywhere else in open mm -hmm. source, right? Um, our job is to make sure that, you know, what comes out of out of um, research and development or community development is consumable by enterprises in a way that is super predictable. Um, and to do that more cost effectively than anybody's ever done it before. It, it, initially, you also touched upon the hype cycle of uh, yeah. is over. Uh, nowadays, we often hear, you know, hey, Kubernetes is everything or containers are the days of open stack are numbered. What do you have to say about that? Is it like true or they will? I don't see OpenStack and Kubernetes competing with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we have an offering mm -hmm. where we say we will build an OpenStack and fully manage it, and then you can have as much Kubernetes as your different dev teams want on top of that OpenStack, and it's all included one price. Mm -hmm. So those two things don't compete with each other at all. Right. Another example is for AI. Say you, you say you've bought a bunch of racks and you've mm -hmm. filled them with GPGPUs, mm -hmm. and now you, you want, have lots of different teams in the business that you want to be using those GPGPUs. Mm -hmm. OpenStack is a brilliant solution. Right. You, we deploy OpenStack, we create instance types that have GPGPUs, teams then create their own Kubernetes on top of the of VMs, 
the performance of the AI code inside those VMs isn't really governed by the virtualization because right. the performance is all on the GP GPUs, right? But you have very good security and isolation and sharing of those GPUs between different tenants effectively in the building. So uh, to me, OpenStack and Kubernetes go together really elegantly. You see right. the same thing on the public cloud, right? Exactly. You have the Azure Kubernetes service on top of Azure. You have the Google Kubernetes engine on top of the Google Cloud, right? So the, the reason I, don't I, know, ask I don't know why everybody's all kind of The like, reason I asked you this question is this. because I want to reiterate that message, you know, that there's no conflict as such. No, because sometimes yeah. it, uh, you, you have mentioned, been mentioning AI a lot of time. I will go to AI at the end, but I'll just touch upon IoT one more time before yeah. me. The use cases of IoTs are like industrial IoTs, NASU. Uh, consumer IoT is totally different. So where is Canonical's focus? Um, remember, we, we're a gateway mm -hmm. to the, the open source platform, right? And so I didn't want us to spend all of our attention on self-driving cars. Right. Self-driving cars generally run Ubuntu, but yes. I didn't, you know, that's work for Audi and Volvo and, and Google and Uber, mm -hmm. right? I want to make sure that, that if they use Ubuntu, they get a highly secure platform mm -hmm. where they can do updates three times a day, mm -hmm. right, with perfect reliability. Yes. Right. So we've invested a lot in security. Mm -hmm. We've invested a lot in new update mechanisms and software delivery mechanisms to Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. But our product is just Ubuntu. Like right. we're not we're not offering a self-driving car solution. We're right. offering the most reliable Linux for self-driving cars. Right. We're not offering a drone solution. Mm -hmm. We're offering the most reliable Linux for a software-defined drone platform. Mm -hmm. We're offering the most reliable Linux for a, 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 an, an intelligent camera platform. We're offering the most reliable Linux for you know, a refrigerator platform. Wh wherever people want to go and innovate, that innovation looks like something physical, a little server motherboard, Ubuntu, Ubuntu Core, if they're doing it at scale and in production, right? And then a set of snaps that represent the unique capabilities of that piece of IoT. Right. right, the motherboard is standard. Ubuntu Core is standard. We take responsibility for the kernel, the the OS, effectively, and all the security associated with that. We take responsibility for isolating the applications from each other, but they take responsibility for their apps. Right. But when you look at IoT, there are, I see three components. One is hardware. Uh, um, one is, of course, the OS that you run, and an application that people run. And in terms of security, all three play a big role. Uh, recently, Microsoft announced the uh, Sphere OS, which is running Linux kernel. But they also have MCU, you know, so they have some influence over the hardware as well. So when you talk about IoT, what kind of influence can Onical can have at the hardware level to ensure that uh, that those two layers are also secure? So, so first, I kind of just wanted to celebrate the moment of Microsoft Sphere, right? At first, I think it's a it's a um, uh, it's a great moment for Linux, and it's a great moment for Microsoft. Right. right? Second, it's a great moment for Ubuntu Core mm -hmm. because I read the the Sphere white paper, which is published in 2018 by mm -hmm. Microsoft, a super credible, forward-looking technology company, and. There are seven key ingredients that they identify. If you look at our design documents for Ubuntu okay. Core, we identified all of those things and we built it as free software over the last six years. So, what so what's, kind of, yeah. what's kind of fantastic for me is, you yeah. know, we always talk about how free software is always kind of playing catch up to yes. the big guys and uh -huh. the proprietary guys. But look at what we've done with Ubuntu Core, right? We're, we, we started with six years ahead, right? And we've delivered as completely open platform Right? Essentially, a free software IoT platform that meets every single one of the tests that, that the Microsoft guys put out in their white paper. That's amazing, right? So I'm super proud of that. So I'm asking, is it, was there any influence from Canonical or two? Or it's like independently they work? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that. And, and we certainly never had any conversations, yeah, okay. right? I think small people come to, come to conclusions. But I think that's a real deep validation of, of our kind of thinking deeply about the next wave of problems and then investing in, in things that maybe not everybody understands so they mm -hmm. can easily become controversial. You know how things can get controversial yes. in the Linux And I try to right? avoid that, yeah. Right, and yet, if we don't do that, we can't be there at the table when the game really unfolds, right? So, so uh, I mean, uh, Canonical or Ubuntu or Unity has been ahead of the time a couple of times. But what then goes wrong, you know, that, you know, we don't kind of, you know, succeed in delivering, you know, the, I mean, we have great ideas, you know, as you said, you know, you're ahead of Microsoft in that sense. 
Oh, look, I think you need, you need a bunch of things to come together to be successful. You need to have the right idea. Right. right? Um, you need to be committed to that. You know, n nothing useful happens, you know, overnight. Right. It takes 10 years to make an overnight success, right? I think you need to have the trust and support of the people around mm -hmm. you. And I think that's a little bit difficult because I think that the open source community and the Linux community is very quick to rush to judgment on new things and very quick to get tribal. Like if that's a new thing from X, oh, then it must be a terrible thing. Right? Well, I haven't even looked at X. I haven't looked at the source code, I haven't, do you know what I mean? But pe people get very emotional about things that don't matter, like which company it came from. Good example of this is my sequel from Oracle, mm -hmm. right? It's still my sequel. It's still open source. They're still investing a ton in it, right? It's great, right? But suddenly, it's easy to troll people into getting angry about that because it's Oracle. That's crazy. That's crazy, mm -hmm. right? So I think you, you, you need to have the right idea. You need to have the support. You need to get given the rope. And, and the community does need to sort of get used to trusting people to go chase ideas like that, chase a dream. Mm -hmm. You need to execute. You know, mm -hmm. if the code is shit, well, then you're going to fail. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if I look at Unity, for example, mm -hmm. it was the right idea. We had some, we had some stress with the community. But there was also problems in the code. Right. You know, we, 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 we were doing a lot of things too quickly. And, 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 and so then we took too long to get it to a position of real quality. And I, you know, I'll take responsibility for that, right? You also need to have a business model for it. Exactly. You know, we, for, we forget about that in open source. But the truth is, yes. you know, people have to eat and you know, they, they will disappear into other proprietary worlds unless we can find good ways to, to feed them. Um, and so, again, when ideas are being put to the open source community, it's healthy for the open source community to respect the idea that there's business going on. That's part of why I stood up here on stage and said, look, focus on the economics of the data center, right? You can't just kumbaya and say, it's all wonderful that we're here together again in Vancouver, talking about a bunch of these shiny projects which might be useful in five years' time, mm -hmm. if you haven't yet solved the economics of the data center, right, after seven years. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those things have to happen. You know, when you, when you get all of those things together, it's great. And when you don't, you learn something. Right, right, right. right. Uh one of the one of the key points of your keynote actually was the demo that you gave at the end, but it got kind of buried in the controversy. Do you like to talk about that, or should we switch to AI? Sure. So what what I demoed was um, work between Google, Canonical, and other companies to standardize the sort of open source workflow for machine learning AI, um, and we and I wanted to show how that helps people essentially. In, empower a set of developers to work on AI applications effectively, um, which they can use in the data center on OpenStack or mm -hmm. bare metal. Um, so that's basically, I was showing Canonical's OpenStack, Canonical's Kubernetes, and then Kubeflow on top of that. Or they can take those apps and take them to the Google Cloud, and there you've got the Google Cloud, Google Kubernetes, which uses Ubuntu effectively. So we can have exactly the same stack and Kubeflow on top of that, again, which uses Ubuntu. So we have this portable layer between your data center and the, and the public cloud. And then I showed something really cool, which is Microcates. Exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's a one command install of mm -hmm. upstream Kubernetes. It's super light. It works on Fedora. It works on OpenSUSE. It works on Ubuntu. It works on Debian, right? So any of the major Linux distributions and any of the minor distributions that's like, like the specialist distributions that's mm -hmm. keen to have snaps, it's dead easy to enable snaps now. It's all upstream. Um, so snap install microcates, and you then get a, a single node Kubernetes, um, the latest version of Kubernetes, and Kubeflow can sit on top of that. So now from your laptop to the rack to the cloud, you have a beautiful kind of developer cycle. And then you could take your AI application, you could take your model that you've trained, turn that into a snap, and ship it to IoT. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, 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 you are here at the conference, you have met a lot of, I mean, you meet your partners either way, you don't have to be at a conference. What are the big challenges, problems that you think that they are facing that the, the community is still not solving or looking into that should be solved? I think the, the um, biggest challenge with OpenStack is the um, uh, complexity and diversity of options. Okay. Um, that's long been portrayed as a strength for mm -hmm, OpenStack. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're doing is we're saying, look, here is a set of um, pre-tested 
um, uh, um, uh, reference architectures for OpenStack, which are in production at telcos, at banks, at media companies, at retail companies. Um, if you use those, you are benefiting from all of the knowledge and all of the mistakes at all of those other companies. And so it dramatically reduces the number of choices people have to make. They still have choice of certain SDNs, for example. They still have choice of some software-defined storage options. It's not a lockdown architecture, but it is essentially a tighter sort of universe of options which are known to work, known to be upgradable, known to work efficiently. So that's really been our kind of ruthless focus over the last year, is take all of that complexity of OpenStack, distill it down to the choices that really matter, mm -hmm. and then do everything we can to make it really easy for companies to go from zero to one rack of OpenStack at a reasonable price. Oh we put up this $300,000 offer, right, which is one rack of great super micro kit plus a full year of managed OpenStack from Canonical. So essentially you need no OpenStack skills up front, you can just get an OpenStack cloud. Now your developers can start accessing that and you can grow it as much as you need and then when it makes sense you can train your people to take over the operations from Canonical, right? Right. But uh, on the keynote day, Mark Collier, he said, you know, the OpenStack is, you know, diversifying the cloud. It kind of contradicts, you know, kind of... Well, you know, in a, in a, in a community you're going to have different opinions. Right, that's true, right? yeah. So, yeah. so clearly each of the members that's of the community true. is entitled to focus on the things they're focused on. Mm -hmm. What Canonical's focused on is time to value mm -hmm. and the cost of the OpenStack. So how can we deliver OpenStack faster? How can we deliver it more cost effectively, mm -hmm. right? I talked about our commitment that we will deliver OpenStack anywhere in the world in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And I talked about the fact that we will do it at a fixed price, which fits in the budget for any department head, right? right? So any department and any company can get OpenStack in two weeks. They will then have time to figure out if that really works for them and how much they want to invest in having their own version of that or, you know, blinging it up, right? Right. But what they, what, they, what they don't have to do is spend months and months and months kind of studying and figuring out and making a bunch of choices that they don't really understand, right? Because we'll put them on rails. And last question, and it's final. When I talk about Kubernetes, Canonical is there. When I talk about OpenStack, Canonical is servers. What is Canonical to do? What kind of company is it? <laughs> well, we're, we're focused on the public cloud, mm -hmm. the data center, and the IoT. And so it would be natural that any place where open source is being used as the first port of call for the data center, public cloud, or IoT, that Canonical is going to be there because people associate us through Ubuntu. They associate us with having the, the best reference distribution of the best current open source software. Awesome. Thank you, Mark, so much. It was great talking to you again. And you.